good. Okay, so hello everyone. We have a bit of time tonight with some interesting questions. So there's a question, somebody saying that in a recent teaching, I had said many, several times, it is what it is. And the question is, how do we really know it is what it is, since our perceptions are usually distorted? And we don't perceive things as they really are. Well, <laughs> this is a, a very important point. When we practice in the higher tantras and in Dzogchen, we practice the method of the result. We act into the view of the awakened. We uh, take that position on and act into it again and then again until it becomes true for us. That is to say, we have the artificiality of adopting a view, a way of looking. But this view is very closely aligned with how it is. It is the unmodified truth as much as that can ever be expressed in language. So just as if you were practicing Tantra, you imagine that you are Padmasambhava. And then you invite the pure form, the natural intrinsic form of Padmasambhava to merge into the form you have imagined. And you do that again and again until you gain the experience that indeed you are Padmasambhava, that all appearances, emptiness and all sound is emptiness and all thoughts and feelings are emptiness. And similarly, from the Sokshin position, when we do the Guru Yoga of the White R, we relax ourselves out of our um, positionings and assumptions. <clears throat> How can we do this? We are identified with these uh, factors. So this is the difference between your skin and your clothes. We wear our skin in a different way from how we wear our clothes. While we're wearing our clothes in the course of the day, the clothes are like a second skin. People see us in terms of the clothes we're wearing and they no doubt uh, have some interpretation as to who we are, how we are, on the basis of what they perceive. The clothes are not our true uh, intrinsic presence. They are an identity which we manifest to negotiate our being in the world with others. So in the evening, we take our clothes off. In the course of the day, it is as if we are our clothes. We are enclosed. But in the evening, we see, oh, this looked like us. It was as if it was us, but it's not me. So in the same way, when we do the, make the sound of ah, we're allowing the clothing, the, the covering of awareness to fall away so that there is simply this fresh naked awareness the obstacle to this is our attachment to and identification with these mental emotional clothings they show my personality how i am as a person but of course this personality has been developed in interactions in the family, school, workplace, and so on. It's not something intrinsic. As long as I feel that these thoughts are my thoughts and they tell me about me, then it seems like a violence to let go of them. I need them. And so I feel as if... Uh, 
I'm being stripped bare. <clears throat> and then like Adam and Eve being thrown out of the Garden of Eden, we're covering our little private parts. Kuntu Zangbo, our original Buddha, he, he is not afraid of being naked. But the ego is afraid of nakedness. Because the ego feels, if you see my nakedness, then you just think I'm nothing. I won't be anyone. It feels I am my qualities, my skills, my place in the world, my income, whatever qualities seem to define me as me. So in the dimension of clothing, it is as it is is difficult to establish because we're hanging on to a covering as if it was the truth about us when in fact it's simply an obscuration. Our dualistic ego self cannot encounter our naked presence because dualistic consciousness is the aspect of our way of experiencing the world whereby we formulate these different kinds of clothing. And this is, this is where you have the subtle seeming paralleling of open and empty as the source of all. And the view that empty means nothing there, nothing at all, oblivion a nihilistic annihilation. So in the Mahayana tradition, for example, through the Heart Sutra, uh, we see the emphasis on the non-duality of emptiness and appearance. Every thought which arises vanishes, but that's not the end because some other formation will arise, be present for an instant, and then vanish. So the more we trust, allowing the mind to move as it moves, and ceasing to identify with selected patterns of that movement, then the more freedom we have to allow the co-emergence of what we take to be I, me, myself, with all the factors which are emerging around us. So in that sense, it is as it is, is not something that we can know through a dualistic cognition, but it is what is revealed when we trust the view and open to it and relax into it. Then we taste it directly rather than knowing about it through uh, reliance on concepts. So now the next question is, is it necessary for us to complete Nundro to fully practice Mahamudra? If not, when is it okay for us to go directly into practicing Mahamudra? Oh. Nundro is this uh, basic uh, preparatory practice that all the Tibetan Buddhist lineages have. It usually has five parts. Each of them is repeated a hundred thousand times. And uh, so there is taking refuge with prostrations, developing bodhicitta, the bodhisattva attitude, offering the mandala, doing the Vajrasattva purification and uh, the, doing Guru Yoga. These uh, five practices repeated again and again are ways of allowing yourself to release yourself from your clothes. So when we take refuge in the Buddha, we turn away from fully identifying with our culture, with our gender, with our race, with our education, we see that these are functional factors, but they are non-essential. Now, 
probably most of us are living immersed in the culture of our country. Every day we encounter many hooks and invitations to identify with the symbols and practices that will identify us as being a, a reasonable citizen of where we live. And because these uh, <clears throat> seductions and uh, invitations are freely available everywhere, it's easy to succumb to them. Therefore, we need to try, from this point of view, we need to try again and again to remind ourselves, I have Buddha nature, I can awaken as a Buddha, that is my true family. And similarly, when we recite the verses for developing bodhicitta, we develop an orientation in our life to help all sentient beings. But all around us are advertisings and uh, shop windows and so on, encouraging us to make choices that we want, make your life work for you. In my own experience of, in Europe, the, the cultural climate becomes more and more uh, isolating, alienated, individualistic. And so thinking about myself, protecting my own interests seems kind of normal and uh, what life is all about. But to develop the idea, I am going to develop all my capacity and turn it for the benefit of others. That's a very unusual thought. This is a task which is incredible. At the end of the day, if you've been working hard, you're tired. But what about all these sentient beings? They're waving. Hey, come on, you promised. What about me? That's hard. If I privilege myself, I'm betraying them. If I privilege them, I exhaust and annihilate myself. So what's being required is to make a leap into the positioning of being grounded in infinity. Infinite emptiness is my own nature. And from this infinite capacity to help all beings arises. So when we first take the Bodhisattva vow, it's our ordinary identity our ego identity that takes it and we progress in this way but we make mistakes we fall back we not reliable so in the Mahayana tradition they talk about the, the seven stages of the Bodhisattva progression and when you get to the sevens and move towards the eighth you move into the irreversible stages because now the basis of your operation or the arising of your capacity is your own empty ground rather than your ego self. So in order to promote that, the, the practice is repeated again and again till it becomes second nature. Because our ego self seems to be our first nature. But actually, our first nature is emptiness. Our second nature is unawareness. Our third nature is individual wandering in samsara. Our fourth nature is to enter into the path of awakening. And our fifth nature is to awaken to the fact that our first nature is the true nature, which is emptiness. That is to say, we are not progressing to somewhere else, but we are awakening to the fundamental basis. The clothes are falling off and this is naked presence. And we offer the mandala, which is to say, 
everything which can be imagined or possessed, we offer this to all the Buddhas. We offer because we want to make connection with the Buddhas. We want to please them. And also we want to let go of our attachment. Especially because the choices that we have made in terms of our possessions have been part of the process of individualizing ourselves, becoming our individual personality. So by offering again and again the sun and the moon, the rivers, the flowers, the plants, all sentient beings, whatever the, could enter into the mind, what you are doing is seeing all that I experience is imagined. I imagine all these phenomena and I believe that they're real and I want more of the good ones and less of the bad ones. So when you offer, you stay with the first point, I imagine all of these things without entering into the second point of they are real and some are good and some are bad. We offer everything. Nothing remains. This is another way of becoming naked. The clothes we put on are not ours. Thoughts arise in your mind. Did you make them? You claim them as yours because they arise in your mind. But if you relax the tendency to grasp and take hold of them, then you see that they come and they go. And it becomes more and more easy to offer them. They were never mine. It was only a transient, situational merging into a pattern of, of appearance. Then fourthly, we have the Vajrasattva purification. This is concerned with purifying strong beliefs. It could be beliefs in the family of uh, aversion, uh, self-hatred, I'm a bad person, I'm useless, I only cause trouble. Or it could be uh, an attachment to positive ideas about oneself. I'm so special, I'm so beautiful, I'm so intelligent, I'm so rich, which would be uh, obscuration arising in the house of desire. Or it could be more basic, uh, a sense of ex personal existence, enduring identity grounded in the house of opacity. I exist. I am. When this is a kind of <clears throat> basic position, it can take on all sorts of formations without ever being uh, exposed to examination. It's uh, axiomatic. We, we take it as just a given. So this is what Vajrasattva is purifying so that we see that our presence is not resting any of, on any of these concepts. And also these, none of these concepts tell us anything true about our uh, true being. And then uh, finally, we have the 100,000 repetitions of the Guru Yoga. The guru stands as the, the one who is uh, awakened without limitation. But, oh, we see some problem with the guru. How can they be perfect if they behave like this and that? Oh, but the text says they are perfect. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I can see what they do. Then you read the text again. You have to think, oh. Maybe I am stupid because I'm starting from the belief or the proposition 
that my own ideas, which are not mine, tell me the truth about everything. Maybe I can't trust my ideas. This is very, very intimate. This is like the underwear. This is the innermost clothing. I have to trust the guru more than myself. The guru is appearance and emptiness. And I am appearance and me. So, I don't want to be not me. But the guru walks and talks and does all kinds of things. They are functioning. They have a wide range of functioning. But maybe it's not spinning around a central point the way I seem to turn around I'm the idea of I, me, myself. Fusing with the guru, whether it's in the tantric visualization system or in the guru yoga of the white R or in, in any of many systems, this arises as a method of opening to emptiness and then manifesting from emptiness. That is, to say, sorry, that is to say, in ordinary life, I believe I manifest from me. There is some kind of profound inner essence, which is me. And that's the, the kind of ground I stand on, the, my inner basis from which I manifest into the world. So the Guru Yoga, which is the relaxing into the state of the guru is the method to release us from the delusion that this uh, reified, uh, contrived inner essence actually exists. Then we start to experience the uh, incredible, the difficult to believe uh, spontaneity of the ground as it flows through us. If I'm not s settled in myself, looking out through my senses at all this other stuff, we start to see that actually I'm never alone. My formation is dynamic and situational how I think and feel and the sensations I have arise in relation with the weather, the seasons, where I am, if I'm hungry and so on. I am part of a field which is co-emergent. Everything arises at once and I am part of the all at once-ness. So oh, this is a, a brief description of the function of the five aspects of the nundro. They are a, the formal nundro is a method for achieving these aims. So is it necessary to do this? That depends. Some people will say it is necessary. Other people will say, look at yourself. Should I do it? If you ask your mother if you should tidy your bedroom, what will she say? Oh, if you ask the teacher, he say, yeah, do the nundra, of course. But do you need to do it? Well, that depends how you are. Are you close with yourself? Close with yourself. Are you close to put it to you? Self, but are you with yourself? Do you see how you emerge in different situations? Do you know that this life is a dream? Do you know that you will die and everything you know will vanish? That this morning is gone. If you're in Western Europe, the afternoon is gone. And then the night will be gone. It's here, 
but ungraspable. So if you're really awake to that, you don't need to do that. But certainly some experience of doing the Nundra is probably helpful, especially because it, these are five activities. Although in the field of Dzogchen, many activities have been developed, like the Semzin, <laughs> and so on. The heart of uh, Dzogchen is not to do anything. It's to relax into the unborn openness as your own ground. And then to allow experience to arise and pass as it does without falling under the power of habitual patterns of identification. However, it's easy to say relax and open. But we are very energetic. So if you have to take small children on a car journey, it's better to first take them into the park and have them run around and climb the trees and go down the slides for half an hour. Then they're a bit tired. So if you do the five activities of the Nundro, it will tire you out. And that helps to weaken the habitual pattern of arousal, which is I form myself through dynamic identification with activity. So if you've been at work all day and you come home and you're tired, it may be that you're carrying too much tension in your body to be able to relax. There might be a problem from work which is going round and round inside you, or you feel a resentment against the way the boss was talking to you. Well, then doing 21 prostrations and reciting the Bodhisattva vow a number of times might be a, a way of usefully, dharmically shifting your composition in that moment. All of these uh, rituals and practices are methods. If you know the function of the method, and you start to see your own pattern of limitation, obscuration, intense arousal, and so on, then you can start to see which method you need to use. Although we pray to the guru sometimes as the father guru or mother guru, Actually, when you do the practice, you have to be able to trust yourself. When you feel like a lost and lonely child, then you pray to the guru. But it's difficult to do the guru yoga of the white art as a lost, lonely child. Lost, lonely children become dispersed. They, they cry, they lose themselves. But to do the guru yoga, you need to be in yourself, present, able to mobilize fully into the practice. That is to say, you have to collaborate with your own present situation, how you are manifesting, and apply the methods which could be useful for you in that position. Okay. So now we get a more abstract kind of question. And this question is, the Dzogchen teachings tell us that all external and internal reality is mind. So we might reframe that as all that appears to be real and uh, truly existing is in fact the energy of the mind. So the questioner continues, that is, all phenomena, sensations, perceptions, thoughts, and so on, are projected into our mind. So I would rephrase that as <clears throat> all these uh, mental experiences, including sensations and perceptions, 
arise in our mind, passing through our mind, and only appear to be ours if our if the deluding ego self nexus claims them as its own possessions or creations. So then it goes on. <clears throat> this uh, seems to be an idealistic conception of reality as opposed to the materialistic vision which we are used to in the West. So <clears throat> this is very helpful for us. This is a question from somebody who is struggling to see how the Buddhist notion of how the world is can fit with the background Western philosophical idea. We can't empty out our whole history of education and the books we've read and conversations we've had. But if we are going to uh, <coughs> go deeply into the Buddhist understanding, then it might be very helpful to see that Buddhism proposes a range of views or ways of viewing. It's as if you had a, a big laboratory microscope and you could adjust the level of magnification. So when you, sorry, <clears throat> when you put it up to plus five, you see things you couldn't see with the naked eye. And if you put it up to plus 20, you see things which you couldn't see with the naked eye or at plus five, but naked eye and plus five have vanished. There's only plus 20. The, the way of seeing reveals different worlds. So we normally view the world through the lens of duality and reification. When we look in this way, we get the world we know, our daily world, with shops and buses and so on. Then we look at the world in terms of a bodhisattva intention, for example. Well, then when we see sentient beings, whether it's birds or fish or cows or humans, these have all been our mother in a previous life. And we have an obligation to help them. So that's bringing a kind of ethical turn into our perception of the world. We're not looking at things out there. We're looking at the obligations flowing through the network of relatedness, which we are already part of. So well, that's why we, we can study these nine different yanas, the nine major views with all their subsections. So, so from that point of view, it's not that we have an idealistic conception of reality. The Buddhist view is that everything is illusion. The world is full of uh, appearances which can be experienced. Hot and cold feel very different. These are qualities of appearance. You can't homogenize everything into just one thing. Yet, the diversity of all the possibilities which we encounter is not pointing to a mass of different things. Everything arises at once like a reflection in a mirror, instantly, just like this. We experience, but we don't experience something. There is no referent, there is no inner essence or outer essence which is behind what appears. So the logic of the Buddhist view cannot be mapped onto the Western view, and neither can the Western view be mapped on to the logic of the Tibetan view. So the question continues, how does this idealistic vision, everything is mind, how does this fit with the Madhyamika philosophy where any conceptualization is avoided? 
the basic uh, <clears throat> issue here is, can the truth be spoken? We're probably all familiar with the image of the six, six blind men and the elephant. One is grabbing the trunk, one the tusks, one the tail, and so on. Each of them is doing their best in terms of the limited amount of information coming to them from what they hold. But even if they discuss together and combine their bits of information, they can't generate the image of the whole. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so <clears throat> if you look at the various Buddhist views as philosophical systems, as they are sometimes considered, and you compare and contrast them, you will see complex patterns, but never the whole. In fact, you will be putting on more clothes rather than taking them off. These views, Madhyamika or the Yogacara, whatever, these are also tools. They are methods. So the central point from the Buddhist understanding is wisdom is grounded in emptiness. That's why Nagarjuna was famous for not establishing any position. When he encountered the propositions of others, he said, neti neti, not this, not this. And yet on top of that, many uh, mountains of words have been built in terms of the philosophy. The mind itself is not a concept. Yet, it is the bright, hospitable space which illuminates the movement of uh, concepts, beliefs, arguments, disagreements. So, as the meditation texts say, if you know one thing, if you know the one truth, everything is revealed. Everything goes free. The one, the one is the empty, ungraspable nature. This sets everything free. Because then you see all appearances are the appearance of emptiness, not the appearance of something. The central point is experience the emptiness of your own mind. And we've looked at this many times. Does the mind come from someplace? Does it stay someplace? Does it go someplace? If you learn to read your own mind, it will be much better than reading any book. Philosophy is compassion. It cannot establish emptiness. It might establish the idea of emptiness for a scholar, But emptiness itself can't be established. So philosophy is compassion because it's, it's like a, a set of little screwdrivers to allow you to loosen the screws holding some of your core beliefs in place. So it, it should be like a massage. It should soften you and loosen you, make you more flexible. The only place to find the truth is your mind. Okay, we have time maybe for one more. Uh, <clears throat> if we have had uh, teachings on POA, the ejection of the mind out of the body, and we can eject our consciousness successfully into a pure land at the moment of death, does that mean we skip the stage of child meet mother luminosity? All the pure lands are forms of the mother child luminosity. For example, the Mandala Palace of Padmasambhava in the, the copper colored mountain is called Pema U, lotus light. The lotus is emptiness. 
the light is the clarity of emptiness. So when you arrive there, you arrive with a body of light within the field of light. So the second aspect to this question is, it said that the bardo is not here, not there, not past, not future. Does that mean the bardo is also illusory? So then it continues, bardo is just another way of saying in between. But if there is nothing to be in between, no A and B, then the bardo is just a label, actually. All of these structures, it's just what I was saying before, all of these structures are compassion. The indescribable field of non-dual co-emergence, the Dharma Datu, the space or sphere or openness of all possible phenomena, everything is there. When you have your experience of this space, it arises for you in particular patterns. So as you in <clears throat> as you participate in the Dharma Datu, it manifests as your experience. <clears throat> if we imagine early in the morning, you are in a, a big health farm. They have three equally built swimming pools. You, there are three people going to eat, one person going to each of these ponds. The water is very still. The first swimmer is a little anxious and goes down the steps into the water. He's swimming with the breaststroke. The waves are rippling out in front of them. The next person dives in very gracefully and we swim with the crawl stroke cutting through the water the legs are going up and down and little lots of little waves are moving out and the third person goes up the steps and dives in with a big splash and then swims doing the butterfly stroke so that their arms are out and crashing on the water the potential of each of these pools was the same in the beginning when the water was calm. But the mode of participation of the swimmers evokes the water into very different patterns of communication. So it's like that. Although we have words like bardo or pure land, they're not referring to some fixed place. For example, I have been in Berlin many times, but because I have stubbornly refused to learn any German, my experience of Berlin is very different from a German person going to Berlin. They are participating through the language which links them with the culture, and I'm looking at the shape of the buildings and the people mediating it through my own assumptions and interpretive matrix. Subject and object are not entities. They are sites of emergence of linked energy or pulsations in the field of energy. So then the last part of the question, what is child luminosity and how do we know we have recognized it via our practice? Either, sorry, on your how do we know? It depends who is asking the question. The ego self will not know. The ego self is unable to recognize that it is in fact the child luminosity. The ego self is blind to how it actually is because it keeps asserting that it is something which it is not. What I was describing there as a field of emergence. The aspect of our participation in the field of emergence is where the mother, which is the field, and the child, which is always already in the field, emerge together. 
how will we recognize this? You can't. This word recognize is very dangerous. It indicates a stable phenomena which was known before and can be known again. Ah, I recognize my shoes. The mind is not something you recognize. Recognition belongs to duality. I recognize what this is. This is my red pen. I have used it a lot, so it's almost empty of ink. I have held it in my hand many times. This is the basis of recognition. James recognizes his own pen. Subject and object. But the luminosity is the unborn emergence in, within the unborn. The field of emergence is also unborn and it is direct. It's not processed through concepts. This is why in uh, Tantra and in Sokshen and in Mahamudra, there is attention to devotion. You have to have faith. It's not a dogma to believe in, which would be, give you something to hold on to. R rather, it's a kind of open-hearted faith, a trust. I don't have to protect myself against this. So I don't need the buffer zone of my habitual clothes to protect me. Through relaxing and opening in this way, allowing myself more openness to my naked mind, the non-duality or non-separation or non-difference of the naked field and the naked mind is obvious. Or it's like that. <clears throat> and you won't know, but you will be. And if you are, then you are. It's exactly what Garab Dorji says in these three statements. The first is open to how it is. Second is, don't remain in doubt. Don't think about how it is. And thirdly, continue in this way. Don't do anything else. It's enough. Because the feeling that I need more or it could be different, I could change it. This is little subtle karmic traces which have not yet been released. Okay, so this brings us to the end of this evening. Thank you to the translators and to Pedro. And uh, we could do with some new questions, so please send them in. If you have any questions you'd like to, be, to have unpacked a little bit. Good. Nice to see your faces. Bye bye. Bye, James. Bye. Thank you. Bye, James. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.